Coming up on this week's show, a rare Sega arcade cabinet is found abandoned. The new Mortal Kombat movie trailer has landed. And we reminisce about the BBC Micro with the creator of Frack, Nick Pelly. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now check out their visual compendium books dedicated to systems like the Super Nintendo, the Atari 2600, their new Game Boy box art collection, and the amazing The Games That Weren't book, talking about video games that never made it to market. You can find out more about those and order today by heading to their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 264, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And uh, I do have to apologise right at the start of today's show. If I sound a little bit slurry, I'm just back from the dentist. I haven't been drinking during the day, just to reassure you guys if, uh, if I sound a little bit that slurry. That sounds like episode. something somebody would say who's been drinking in the day to cover up <laughs> good excuse. <laughs> <Good excuses. laughs> well, I did finish at 2pm today. What else are you going to do in the afternoon? Uh, apart from play, retro video games. There you go, get it back on topic. Now, uh, this is a show where each week we reminisce about classic video games. We take you behind the scenes and get the stories of the people that made them The people that made our childhoods, essentially, which is one of the reasons I love doing this show. And that was always the aim. You know, often we get interviewed by people and they're like, you know, why did you start doing this podcast? For me, it was really to find out these stories from the guests that we get each week. Yeah, there's nothing better than getting it from the horse's mouth and, you know, kind of getting all these stories and also finding out the truth. Because a lot of the time we check out Wikipedia and stuff and it's all a bit inaccurate. So actually Mm. getting the guys to talk is uh, really fantastic. And this week... You know, we've got someone who's really great. This is Nick Pelling, and uh, he was a BBC Micro developer and the creator of Frack. Yeah, I mean, Frack was a really impressive game on the BBC Micro. It had that, like, you know, proper arcade feel to it as well. And actually, Frack's just been re-released on Steam. And Nick's kind of made the ultimate version that, you know, that he wishes he could have made when he released it back in the mid-80s. So definitely worth checking that out. And I mean, he worked on a load of other games as well, including uh, Ghostbusters 2 for Activision, um, The X-Files, a PlayStation game, um, Duke Nukem 3D. He worked on a load of stuff back in the day. Um, Four decades in the video games industry. And actually, it's quite timely that we're doing an episode focused on the BBC Micro, as that system actually celebrates its 40th anniversary a bit later on this year. It was a huge system, wasn't it? Like, I, I didn't have one myself, personally. Oh, but... no one could afford one at home. <laughs> but, but, but I had access to one at school, and uh, I was in that sweet period where the Micros were still there, and then the Acorns came later. So it was kind of like you had the choice of the two machines. Yeah, we had, like, um, in, like, early school, you know, when I was small, we used to have like BBC Micros and Archimedes when I went to secondary school and then PCs. But I remember, I mean, I remember being about like seven, eight years old. And actually, because I took an interest in computers, um, looking back, it was probably a bit like child labour. They actually got me in about half an hour early in the morning to set the computers up every day. Get them out of the big safes and the lockers. (laughs) Yeah, that was it, yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, the BBC Micro, I mean, that was really the system that got me into computers, you know, before I even owned one as a kid. So, love doing episodes about the BBC Micro. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And also, um, patrons can check this out uh, tomorrow at the time the show comes out. Everyone else, hopefully it'll be recorded and we can link it up in the video description. But we're actually going to be doing a talk tomorrow for the VHS. Now, uh, we're not talking about old, uh, an old video medium here. This is the Video Game Heritage Society. Yeah, so this is a really interesting national project. And I don't think this has happened in the UK. It's an actual society that's been created uh, with interest of uh, museums, heritage institutions, institutions, developers and publishers, also private collectors, which is really cool. So, um, you know, we're one of the founding members, which I'm I'm so proud that we're in there. And uh, the other members are the BFI, uh, the National Science and Media Museum, Museums of London, um, C64 Audio as well. You know, we had uh, Chris on and Chris Abbott, and he did some fantastic stuff with Rob Hubbard. Centre for Computing History in Cambridge, Bath Spa University and the British Library. So it's fantastic to be involved with this because I think this is hopefully going to grow and basically, you know, help people preserve video games and and turn it into more of a heritage thing because uh, it's a hobby at the moment. But, you know, it's, it's, it's culturally important and it's really significant. So we're going to be doing an event uh, which is called Reimagining Video Game Hardware. And we're going to be talking about stuff like 
FPGAs and uh, Raspberry Pis and all these kind of devices which help you increase your video gaming hardware and add new functions that weren't previously there. Because that is a big part of retro today, kind of pushing these old systems to the limit and also doing things that weren't possible when they originally came out. I mean, you know, if you'd have told me when I was a 10-year-old kid that, you know, one day I'd have a Mega Drive with a, a little card in there that would have every game ever made accessible at the click of a button, you'd be like, no way. Yeah, totally mind blown there. And uh, hopefully we can add some of our expertise about video games and also work with other organisations. But you guys can join up as well. So if you've got a great private collection and uh, you want to kind of show it off or, or, or talk about it and kind of you know, get it some more attention, then check out vhs.themvm.org. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing that on a Thursday afternoon. Like I said, hopefully it's going to be archived. Um, and uh, if we get the video up on YouTube, we'll put it on our socials as well. Looking forward to that. Now, before we get into this week's show, plenty of things to talk about that new Mortal Kombat movie trailer that's been absolutely everywhere. We've got some thoughts on that to tell you about in a moment. Before we do, let's give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor and uh, tying in with our guest this week, the amazing new Acorn, A World in Pixels book by our mates at iDesign. Now, this is a book that celebrates the visual game's history of the BBC Micro and the Acorn Electron. And I've got to say, I mean, they sent me a copy of this book and it is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Check out this slipcase. Listen to this. That is the case. Sounds rock solid. <laughs> I thought you were going to like slide it in and out then, but that sounds heavy, man. <laughs> well, the book itself, I mean, obviously it's hard yeah. to kind of talk about the quality of books and um, real the weight of this volume on a podcast. But check this out as well. That is a book landing on my table and nearly breaking it in half in front of me. <laughs> this has got some weight to it. 476 pages and featuring over 150 classic games that were loved on the BBC Micro and the Acorn Electron. And also they interview people who were behind them as well, including legends like David Braben and Ian Bell, who were behind Elite. Oh yeah, Elite was such an amazing title. And, you know, they did so much with so little. It was kind of... One of the first open world games and with a bit of like procedural generation, you could just keep going on. A really fantastic title and it was it's in one of the top 50 games, that is. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more in here as well. I mean, Jeff Crammond, Revs and Aviator, Peter Irvin, who did Exile, Tim Tyler, who did Repton, many more as well, including um, talking about things like key publishers on the platform, cover art, classic magazines. That was such a big part of the scene back then. And also it shows off the style, including anecdotes and visual captures from programmers, artists, publishers, games like Elite, Chucky Egg, Repton, Exile, Starship, and Snapper. That was one of my favourite games on the Acorn Electron back in the day. That was a really cool Pac-Man clone. So if you want to get hold of this for yourself we've actually got you a really good discount yeah man so if you head over to idesign.com which is i-d-e-s-i-n-e.com you can get the book today using our exclusive code retro hour to save five pound off the regular retail price of 29.99 which also comes with free postage and packaging for the uk as well which is awesome which I think, so, bearing in mind the weight of this book, I think the post yeah. should be about that anyway. So uh, <laughs> definitely claim this while it's on uh, idesign.com, or of course I'll put the link in our show notes as well. And of course, listen out for today's interview with Nick Pelling, the creator of Fracker, also appears in the book as well. So before we get into Nick, plenty of new stories to get into this week, including the new Mortal Kombat trailer. What do you think, Joe? Well... I've I've got quite a few thoughts about it and you know we're not the retro hour free out retro free hours so you know I'll try and keep it short and I know Ravi's got a few few things he wants to say about it but I think it looks good I like the look of it I like the visual style um I love that you know they've got all these characters in I, I, you know I think they've got like 10 or 11 12 characters in there they've not overdone it with like 30 of them and they've not underdone it with like concentrating on like two or three of them it looks like from the trailer Sub Zero is a bad guy and Scorpion's a good guy, which I'm sure is the other way around in the games. I could be wrong. Um, it could be and, wrong. And Kano's a good guy in this. Is Kano a good guy? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I thought he was Apparently a bad guy so from the, the trailer. trailer. But oh, right, interesting. But what I thought was really interesting um, is and kind of annoying until I looked into it a little bit more. They've introduced a new character called Cole Young, played by Lewis Tan. Um, who seems to be the main character. Now I'm I'm pretty familiar with Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. I've played them all. I don't remember anybody called Cole Young in the games. Um, so I was a little bit, oh, for God's sake, not, they're not like they've done with Resident Evil films and introduced their own character and all this kind of stuff, you know. I don't care about him. I want to know about, you know, Liu Kang and Jax and Sub-Zero, who are all in the films, 
all big characters in the films, but the main character seems to be this Cole Young. However, I'm not going to spoil it. I don't know how true it is or anything, but if you go out there on the internet, he is somebody from Mortal Kombat. He is somebody. So, you know, if you want to check that out, you know, it's on the internet. It's been leaked. The script's been leaked and stuff like that. So which is so it's 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 kind of cool where they're going with it from from what I've read. But Ravi, you you weren't as keen on it as me and Dan, were you? No, I, I'm 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 not that into modern action movies. And like mm. look at looking at this trailer, um that there's some good points. Like Shogun Assassin, which I count as one of the biggest influencers. Um halfway through there's a section. Um I'm not sure which enemy it is. I'm not up to date on Mortal Kombat, but this is a total total tribute to shogun assassin Mm. like the point where he has a blade that goes into the wall and then goes down with the blood that's like one of the famous scenes in uh shogun assassin which was one of those it was actually banned back in the days and it was a direct influence so i think that's quite good but it's just the actors like the way that they're speaking they just seem so bad and like you know i i get that it's an action movie and you're really there for the action and stuff but it it just feels a bit like i don't know high school musical 2 or something like (laughs) i'm gonna have to agree with your point there about i mean there's a moment in the movie and scorpion is my favorite mortal kombat character i know where you're going with this yeah i'm gonna listen listen to this yeah i don't know what what is that (laughs) <laughs> is that Arnie? Arnie's voice. That sounded like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Get down. <laughs> I don't know what. The, I expect him to say to the chopper next. Yeah, I remember hearing that and thinking, "What on earth is that?" Like, but I guess it's because he's <laughs> they're being realistic. He's he's muffled by his mask. <laughs> like, I don't. I know. thought you I know they could have done this it. really well. It like it does look good, and there's so many references to the old Japanese movies here. Like, and you know, with with. The kind of sunset going and and the shadows and stuff, uh, silhouettes and stuff like that. But they could have done what they did with like Cobra Kai or Stranger Things and they could have had a fat synth going through that. And then they could have gone kind of a bit like retro-y. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I'm sure towards the start of the trailer, you can kind of hear in the background the Mortal Kombat song, like a kind of like sort of remix of it i could be completely wrong i've only seen the trailer twice i know what I, you I, want joe you want yeah it. I, I do i want it i want it in there <laughs> so we'll see you know a lot of people are saying online that this looks like really cheesy and stuff and people are saying it looks fun um but people obviously don't remember the original mortal kombat movie if you want cheesy <laughs> yeah. even though that was a load of fun but i think it kind of feels like this movie has grown with the Mortal Kombat series. I mean, the first one, yeah, it was naff, but it really felt like, you know, it was a, a tribute to the games as mm. they were then. But looking at this, I mean, there's one bit in the trailer that I thought was incredible. When you see Sub-Zero freezing his own blood and using that as a knife, that is something I could imagine being in one of the model, modern Mortal Kombat games. Yeah, yeah you, you see, I don't like those games, so that's scary. Oh, Ravi, get off, man. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> Too much of a wimp. <laughs> Too much of a bloody wimp. Yeah, man. And apparently there is fatalities in the film. Like, you know, obviously it's not going to be like, I'm guessing it's not going to be quite like, finish him and they're stood there like well, dizzy. The, the actors have but, to remember the combo. Yeah, <laughs> but apparently there is like, you know, people do actually get killed and they're going to get, like you say, splattered with ice knives. I think there'll be a, like a babality. <laughs> babality. <laughs> Ravi will go see it if there's a babality in it. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a gift. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so I, mean, I, as someone who loves Mortal Kombat, I mean, it's always been my favourite fighting series, you know, since that first game in 1992, right up to the current version that, you know, one of my most played games on my Switch. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this. It just looks like loads of fun, I think, which is yeah. like, the main thing is it looks like a good, fun tribute for the fans. So you've got to think with these games, I mean, didn't was Mortal Kombat Annihilation? That was a movie. I, I remember seeing a bit of that and thinking it was terrible. I love it. That was a movie. <laughs> that, that, let's just leave it at that. It was a film. It happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I half watched that on like a dodgy downloaded copy and thought, what the hell is I, this? I, I'm um, not afraid to admit I've seen a Mortal Kombat Annihilation about five times. Probably. And yeah, you were, and you're a fan? You know, I, oh, pff, uh, would I say I'm a fan? It's a terrible film. I watched Mortal Kombat 1 about a year ago on Amazon. Not going to lie, I looked up to see if Anni- Annihilation was on there and it wasn't, you know, so <laughs> that says it all really. I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but I'll sit there and I'll watch it and I'll, and I'll smile at the mindlessness of how terrible it is. 
So. See, that is the thing. These movies are made for the fans of the game. They're not made for the critics, mm. I think, which is like, you know, a good thing that they've gone down that route again. I think anyone that doesn't love the modern Mortal Kombat games is going to like this movie, I think. Yeah, pretty much. So um, not long to wait either. It's going to be out on uh, April 16th. Um, not sure whether it's going to be in cinemas, depends if they're open by that stage. If not, I'm sure it'll be on some of the uh, big streaming platforms. Now let's talk about something um, that seems to be a bit of a running trend at the moment, although this one is a new leak on a Nintendo platform that apparently... Didn't come from the Giga Leak. Yeah, this is really cool. This is Dinosaur Planet, which um, some people might know became Star Fox Adventures on the GameCube. Um, long story short, I think so. Rare were making Dinosaur Planet as an N64 game, uh, which was meant to come out around 2001, 2000. Uh, and essentially, Miyamoto saw it and was pretty much like, that looks like it could be a Star Fox game. Put Star Fox in it. And Nintendo just kind of took over and turned it into Star Fox Adventures. Um, so yeah, this this has been leaked. It's Forest of Illusion again, who we've spoke about before. They've bought a copy of it on disc, which a private collector had, which I assume he probably got one from one of the rare developers. Um, and the build on it is from December first, two thousand. And they've got the disc. It's got the whole game on there. And they, yeah, they've managed to get it running on an N sixty four, and they've leaked it. Um, so I'm pretty sure you can go out there and download it, but it, it looks pretty cool. It looks like what Star Fox Adventures would have looked like if it came out on the N64 and they it kept the original uh, characters. Very rare, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, it's it's definitely got like that Banjo Kazooie or, or you know, Conkers, Conkers, kind of. Bad Fur Day, Donkey Kong 64 kind of look to it. Absolutely, and it's got a very Ocarina of Time kind of feel to it as well because you can kind of tell that's what you know that was the big game at the time. You can kind of, you know, sense that they were going for that. But yeah, like... Visually, it looks very similar. I actually think visually it looks better than Ocarina of Time. I think it looks really good. Yeah, I mean, this is about a year or two later than visual uh, than Ocarina of Time. I was going to say visual of time then. <laughs> about a year or two later than Ocarina of Time. So yeah, I think visually it does look better as well. And I, I can't unsee it now, Ravi said, Conker's Bad Fur Day. Um, yeah, how much have they got of this then? Because they've posted like 20 minutes of... A footage of it so I, I could be wrong but it's pretty much the almost the full build of the game wow so it's yeah. not quite 100 percent. it says it's not quite 100 percent perfect but it's pretty much the full build of the game the story's out there or you know there's loads of videos on the story i have watched them before i'm just can't my mind isn't refreshed at the moment but i'm pretty sure the game was pretty much done when nintendo were like yeah let's put star fox in that and yeah, Rare was kind of like oh okay it seems <laughs> like they say it's a work in progress code but oh, okay. That there, there, there's a few graphical glitches and shadows and lightings and stuff mm. and slowdowns, but it probably has a full game on there. Yeah. Like, um, it's just you know you've got these glitches that need a dying and out. Yeah, I wonder how much they bought it for from the uh, private collector. Obviously, they're not going to say. But and then I want to know where he got it from. I, I'm just going <laughs> to assume he probably got it from one of the guys at Rare, or he could yeah. be one of the guys from Rare. You know, but yeah, very interesting. It looks like a late build as well because it's got Fox McCloud in here hasn't it so it, it is you know it, that that universe is already in the game even on the n64 oh yeah that's a good point i wasn't sure if he just that character just so happened to look like fox or not no if you if you look in the screenshots yeah. on you know the, the oh, yeah, tweet, it says i am fox on the McLeod, third one, yeah yes yeah, so it must have been you know when they were transitioning and then yeah, okay. i guess by the time the game was ready to come out they thought we might as well bring it out on the gamecube yeah yeah absolutely so yeah no so pretty late on then like you say I'm loving all these betas that keep coming out at the moment. It's like, it feels like every week we're getting something new right now. It's crazy. It, it all seems so, to be um, Nintendo as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're probably raging. <laughs> like, yeah, no, probably. every week. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about a sad story. Um, because we've talked about the amazing arcade cabinet, the Sega R360, um, on this podcast several times. I've got memories of going to Scarborough as a wee lad. And uh, begging my dad, I think it was about three pounds to play in it for about two minutes. They had one in Scarborough. Um, wow. They did. I remember, because at the time, there's a lot of like Sega branded arcades that were everywhere. I'm not sure whether it was an official one in Scarborough, but I do remember it was like, you know, one of the, the seafront arcades. It was like mm. right at the front when you walked in. And they had like an attendant who had to, you know, stay yeah. there with like all day long and you take your money then to put like a little um, a chain over before you got in there as if that was going to protect anything. Um <laughs> And there was like a big red emergency stop button in case you're going to puke after, you know, eating too much candy floss before you got on it. Um, but this was that insane gyroscope-like arcade cabinet 
um, that was around. Actually, quite interestingly, reading this article, most of them were based in the UK because of yep. all these Sega arcades. Like, I remember, um, they've said in the article, you know, is it a Trocadero? I remember going to the yeah. Trocadero when it was there and it never worked. That siren was going constantly. And there was guys just repairing it. And like everyone would go by and go, what the hell is that? Oh, it never works anyway. <laughs> but oh, maybe, really? maybe that was just my experience <laughs> of the truck and hero. I mean, it was quite a complicated. I mean, it wasn't really an arcade. It was more of a ride, really, than an arcade mm. machine. Um, hence the need for having attendance there, which I think was one of its downfalls. The fact that arcades had to employ you someone. You had to pay somebody a full-time wage to fix it and let people on and off it and probably clean puke off it. D- d- yeah, because big boy Barry got trapped inside it. <laughs> <laughs> Upside down, yeah. Yeah, we've heard that story. Check out the interview with Big Boy Barry if you want to hear more about that. But one of these has been found then, because these actually, I'm actually part of this group on Facebook. There's about a 1,000 people in there, um, a Sega R360 fan club on there. And they posted these pictures of a rather sorry-looking R360 that's been found in a field. Yeah, in Belfast. So, yeah, apparently um, when the the arcade closed down, um, I don't know what year it was, they kind of just like moved it into a local farmer's like farm you know like in one of the farmhouses he's got and apparently nobody ever came to pick it back up so he just kind of ditched it in a field um i imagine quite a few years ago from the look of it um and now it's just sat there rotting away um you know all 2200 pounds of it you know so it's a pretty heavy piece of kit um but the guy who posted this um has since posted saying that um he was going to go back with a lorry and try and pick it up so I don't know whether he's done that, but I don't don't think there's going to be help to recover this, to be perfectly honest, in the I, state of it. Imagine just being drunk, walking through a field in Ireland, and then seeing this, you'd think <laughs> aliens have landed. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I found some pretty cool stuff in the countryside. You know, nice little pubs normally, you know. Yeah. Maybe not, <laughs> what, a few sheep, what, but yeah, never a Sega R360. You know, this reminds there. me of that guy that found the, 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 the mad um, Sonic, sta- Sonic on a snowboard. In in Japan, in that forest, just randomly stuck <laughs> up randomly there, just sat there. I think what's interesting about it is I didn't realise they only ever made two hundred of these. Yeah, which that is mad. Kind of makes it even sadder. And then to think, like you say, a lot of them were in the UK. Um, so you know, I, I mean, I don't know where the other one hundred and ninety nine are if they're even about. But yeah, man, it's well. It's there sad. are quite a few of them in collectors' hands today. Mm. Um, you know, if you go in that group on Facebook, um, there are quite a few of them that people have in their own private collections. And you know, if I ever built my own arcade, that'd be definitely something I'd want to have. In <laughs> Could never afford one. Sam, in a million can years, I have obviously. this in the living room? <laughs> <laughs> well, just, well, actually, we're getting our garage converted soon into a room, so that could be. Can you uh, imagine? She just walks in, and you've got one of these now. <laughs> Siren blaring. <laughs> Joe, there is a full time attendant. Yeah. <laughs> just like I just put my hand up and just like you know move the chain for go on them. <laughs> Take my three quid. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, apparently the saying here, I mean, like you said, Ravi, it is unrestorable because it's been out, you know, in the all weather conditions for the last twenty five years or so. But I mean, there might be parts of it maybe that can use to service some of the working ones. I don't know, but it, it does look a pretty sorry state, doesn't it? I mean, it, it will hurt you if you want to look at these pictures. Yeah, it's probably uh, fan of the good, good for scrap. But um, the, it looks like the PCBs are there, though, and the kind of um, the actual computing unit is is still there because there's a photo with just these smash boxes and wires hanging out. So maybe someone could recover that. Yeah, fingers crossed there is some value still to be had there. If not, like you said, it makes an interesting find for people walking through the field after a few drinks at the country pub. Now, Super Nintendo news. Now, this one is very cool. It's always amazing to see when someone's actually improved a commercial game that came out back in the day. And at this one, they've actually made it playable. This is a game that came out originally on the Atari ST. There's an arcade version of this as well. Um, And also on the Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo. But this ran abysmally on the SNES in particular. But someone has made race driving finally playable on the Super Nintendo. Yeah, this is crazy. So um, originally it ran at four frames per second and, you know, it was... just said that again. Is is that four frames a second? Four. That is ridiculous. And it was incredibly juddery and and really hard to play, actually. Um, But the SNES conversion, it seems that somebody's actually got it to address the SA1 processor, which has increased the game uh, to a thousand times faster compared to the original. So they've got this wonderful comparison where they've got the original version and the SA1 version running and it's just light and day. You know, it, it looks beautiful. 
I was going to say, me and my brother used to play this. I say me and my brother, my brother used to play this. And I used to sit there thinking, this game is actually awful. And this, like, this is literally when I'm like five years old, when you think everything's amazing. Like, I'm actually astonished how much better this looks. Like, and like, it doesn't even sound like from reading the article, they've had to do much to it to get it to run so much quicker. Yeah, it's not like, you know, you're you're putting in a a Super FX chip or some extra kind of stuff. This is already an existing one, you know, Uh, so it could have... Well, the SA1 was like, it was like a Super FX. Oh, was it? I think it it was in about, yeah, 30 or 40 cartridges used it. It was later than than the Super FX, but it is, it's hardware of that time. Okay, Okay, so, so, so you do need to have this special cart then, I guess. Yeah, you'll need the chip for it to work, I imagine. Um, but again, I mean, because it's using contemporary hardware that was around then, it, it's more impressive to me than, you know, something like that Doom port that we saw running on the Super Nintendo using an Ever, EverDrive recently, yeah, on the Mega yeah. Drive, rather. No, it's re- really impressive. And, uh, uh, you know, it's probably brought new life to this game. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of people here are saying it's even better than the, the arcade version now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's great to see it when people can improve classic games like that do you think you'll play it again then joe now um it's probably too much effort for me to do that to the cartridge um no i probably won't i'm not a massive fan of the game but I've got, i have got memories of my brother purposely hitting the cow in it just to get it to move and stuff like that so well now that cow will bounce off your bonnet at a lovely 30 frames a second now, joe. <laughs> now before we get into our chat with nick pelling all about frack and the bbc micro you're going to really enjoy this one let's talk about something that kind of follows up an episode that we did a while ago this is the text adventure literacy jam that's just begun yeah so we covered uh adventure on which was a great system for creating text adventures well they're actually having a games jam and it's just started um it's got some great prizes as well so if you guys are creating text adventures or games then get involved with this because um you can get a raspberry pi 400 a uh, Raspberry Pi 4, there's a Raspberry Pi Pico edition of Classic Adventure magazine, as well as Pico 8 licenses. But also, the legend Scott Adams is actually going to be judging this. And uh, we all know Scott Adams was one of the original guys. Uh, he did Adventure Soft and one of the very first text adventures uh, for microcomputers. So this is really interesting. And I love this piece of software, Adventure On, as well, because it can be used on your mobile phone it can be used on your browser but also your classic systems you know what actually hearing that that it's going to be judged by scott adams makes me <laughs> almost a little bit nervous for people that are <laughs> going to be entering imagine that getting you were judged by an icon like that but what an accolade if he loves it yeah totally so um we're going to have a link in the description it says it starts on the 25th of february and uh it's already started but you've you've got a while uh till it finishes so it's going to be finishing on the 31st of march so you've got some time. So you could get your adventure game in front of Scott Adams and win some amazing prizes as well. If you're an adventure game fan, definitely worth giving that a look. Like Ravi said, we'll link it up at the retrohour.com. Now, just before we chat to Nick Pelling, a quick reminder that this week's show is brought to you with our good friends at iDesign, who are behind Acorn, A World in Pixels. This amazing new book, 476 pages covering 150 classic games that if you're a fan of the BBC Micro back in the day, you will remember Chucky Egg, Elite, Repton, so many more as well. And actually... You can read about the history of iconic publishers on the platform, like Superior Software. They were massive back in the day. Micropower, The Legends of War, Acon Soft, Timesoft as well, Ultimate Play the Game, and also learn about magazine publishers of the time, how the games industry evolved, and how many lost and found games of the era have worked out, and much more as well. And there's some gorgeous artwork on this book as well, Ravi. Yeah, there's uh, some new artwork, actually, coming from one of the Pickford brothers, Steve. And, uh, you know, they were absolutely legendary. And also, Les Ives, who was the original cover artist for Micropower and Superior Software as well. So if you were a fan of the Acorn, BBC Micro or the Electron, this is an unmissable book. And actually, we managed to get you an exclusive code so you can get a fair bit off the cover price. Yeah, so you can use the code RETROHOUR to save yourself £5 off the regular retail price of £29.99. And you also get free postage and packaging in the UK, which is awesome. All you need to do is head over to iDesign.com, which is I-D-E-S-I-N-E.com and follow the link in our show notes. Yeah, and you can claim that book. Claim the offer while it's on. So we get so many people who get in touch after and they're like, oh, I missed that. So don't do it right now. Honestly, if you're a fan of the BBC Micro on the Electron, you need to read this book. It's gorgeous. Now, we're going to be chatting to Nick Pelling, who features in the book in just a minute. Let's give a big thank you to our incredible 
patrons. Now, of course, we mentioned last week the reason that we do have a patron running is that really to keep this podcast going week in, week out. We have so many costs that build up doing this, not only serving it to you, getting our website up and running, buying equipment. We're all as nervous that Joe's going to spill, you know, a glass of Guinness into his, uh, his road car. Guinness. While doing the show. More like Fanta or something, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> I'm brew. <laughs> <laughs> so it is always good that we, you know, we have this patron going to help us out with any emergencies. And like I said, you guys really came into your own last year when um, COVID struck and we couldn't get together in the studio. You know, we wouldn't have been doing the show today if it wasn't for our patrons' support. And of course, you can join us for our patrons' hangout. There is going to be another one coming up uh, next weekend, first weekend of March. We'll be doing one of those. And also, we're about to record our uh, new patrons' exclusive podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours. Now, uh, in this one, we're going to be stepping into the time machine and going back to the year... 1999. You ready to celebrate the millennium again, boys? It's a big year of change, wasn't it? Well, we're going to be actually going back to that year, doing some reminiscing, not only about what we were doing in gaming, but also systems that are coming out, a um, bit of entertainment stuff as well. It's going to be such a laugh, just kind of reminiscing about that in there. The retro years, we're going to be calling it, 1999, that will be in the next episode of our patrons' exclusive podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours. And also there are a few other perks as well. Get the episodes early of the normal podcast get yourself a nice t-shirt and also you can get a mention in the retro hour hall of fame like this week we want to say a big thank you to our newest platinum supporter uh, bryce l tomlinson who's got a quick message he said go check out his uh, youtube channel it's called bro bryce 64 and you can check out kaleidoscope reloaded for some commodore retro fun edvin helland brian condron bob baisley and fabrice deville who all made donations into our Patreon. We massively appreciate that, guys. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find it on our website at theretrohour.com. Right, I think we've teased it long enough. Let's get on this week's special guest talking about the legendary game Frack. Four decades of working in the video games industry. We are joined by the amazing Nick Pelling next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, it's an honour to be joined by our guest this week, someone who's worked in the games industry for four decades and behind some absolute classics, including the BBC Micro legendary game Frack, that is, of course, back again for 2021, which we'll talk all about and more with this week's special guest, Nick Pelling. Welcome to the show, Nick. Hello. Really Great nice to have here. you joining us. Yeah, fantastic to have, to have you on. Now, before we get into the story of those games, I mean, kind of going right back to the beginning, I was reading that your first system was an Acon Atom. Tell us a bit about that machine and what kind of got you into computers in the first place. The Acorn Atom was um, Acorn's precursor to the BBC. Well, one of the, one of the, one of the precursors. They were, they were, I made mean, a whole load of different systems at the time. But Acorn Atom was their first kind of high street sort of game, games machine. And it had all the things the BBC, but not quite done as well. So the, if you see the BBC Micro, that's kind of the Acorn Atom done right. So that's that's basically what it was. It was just a, a home machine. Before that, I'd uh, had programmable calculators, if you remember those. Yeah. And um, I'd had fun, because I was a mathematician, um, programming matrix stuff into them, into their 256 steps. So I, I, would, I was kind of a geeky and... Um, the Acorn, Acorn Atom was the next step up. What what language were you using, and uh, what was the first game you wrote? Oh, the first game I wrote uh, was Space Invaders, I think. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm, I wrote a game called, he- called Hedgehog, which is kind of a, um, a Mode 7 teletext, crossing the street type thing, with a little kind of um, X. Hedgehog was the X. Um, and all these kind of um, block graphic cars coming past. Um, I've just got the tapes here. I'm just trying to um, bring it back to life. For, I think that was my first game. It was either that or Space Invaders. Actually, the dirty secret of Space Invaders was I wrote that for my A-level computer science, and they disallowed it, so I got zero marks for it. Wow. So then I took, the, took it a year, year later and uh, got an A. But one, of those, one of those stupid things. Was that just a timing thing then, do you think? Um, I think they basically just got the arse because it wasn't something worthy, you know. A, a game? A computer game? <laughs> what kind of a fool do you think we are? Well, I know at a young age, you um, when you were working on the Acorn Atom, you actually came to Acorn's attention, Acorn Soft. What was kind of the story there? Oh, that's a bit funny. Um, I had one day where I've been selling my um, Space Invaders and my Galaxians game in the back of your computer, the small ads. That was quite fun. Um, and I'd formed a little company called Aardvark Software. Not because I wanted to be first in, first in the you know, dictionary, well, uh, but I, I just liked the name. It's just funny. One of those kind of... Um, Obsc- you know, obscenely obscure names. Aardvark, double A. 
that um, every Scrabble player loves. And I've been selling those. And one day, one Friday, I had this kind of strange sensation that someone was talking about me and I couldn't, couldn't shift it all day. And it was a Friday. And the next, next morning, I found out that, that actually Acornsoft had been trying to get hold of me all that day because they'd seen my game and um, they wanted me to come to Cambridge to write it for their new BBC computer. So I went up on Saturday and came home with a brand new uh, BBC B under my arm and started writing Arcadians before it became Arcadians. And, and, and what was it like, Acorn, back then? Um, Acorn Soft. It was, um, it was poky little offices on two floors in Market Hill in Cambridge, run by David Johnson Davis, who was an interesting bloke, and um, a bunch of people there. And some of the guys working there um, are full of kind of games lore, um, or your, uh, Neil Raines and Jonathan Griffiths and everyone, and Tim Dobson. And it was, it was great fun you know, working with them, because basically you know, I kind of self-taught myself to that point, really. And they basically, you know, Neil Rain would, would kind of bang on about you know, making optimal code, and Jonathan Griffiths would bang on about making readable code, and Tim Dobson would just laugh. So that was fine. That was the, the three of them was great. It was a great, great place to learn how to code. Well, the early 80s, I mean, must have been an exciting time to be getting into computers in Britain. Did they kind of feel like there was a big buzz around it? Oh, there was a huge buzz. But it wasn't always the buzz of, buzz of, of a good kind. The, the media of the day was particularly rabid. There was lot, so much hype. Um, the kind of, he's 17 years old, he's got a Porsche, but he can't even drive yet. It's kind of stuff. And um, people were kind of fed a diet of this kind of sensational stories. You know, part of them were, were, were you know, computer games companies just hyping their programs up, hyping their games like, you know, like Imagine, play the game, and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, um, one way of doing it. But I, I didn't really like it, and so I was kind of felt, felt a bit left out from it all, really. It was just a bit of a circus, and I, I didn't really feel like a forming seal. Well, I remember watching, you know, the commercial breaks documentary, and I've watched it, you know, quite a, a few times on YouTube, um, covering Ocean and Imagine back then. And it did seem like that in all these stories of like, you know, um, teenage whiz kids that are suddenly like millionaires and they're buying mansions and helicopters and all that. I mean, did, did you see much of that then or did you just kind of no, just not want to be involved in that? It was just a lie. It was just a lie. There were maybe two people who made a load of money. They, you know, and basically one of those nearly killed himself on drugs. So that's not really, that's not really great kind of um, storytelling. But that's how that's how they, they presented it. Um, in, in reality, most of the people who wrote games were exploited, and it, and um, didn't make much money at all. You know, if if you talk about it, you'll find from that period, it's just a period of just ex, ex, you know um, greedy people exploiting kids. And that was it, really. That's kind of, that's kind of sorry to be be boring about it, but that's how it worked. Well, you published games under a pseudonym at first. That's right. Orlando M. Pilchard. Yeah. <laughs> what was the story there then? Oh, it's one of these things that happened at school. I went to a civil engineering open day. Uh, you, you know, you're trying to find a career. They say, oh, go to this, this open, open day. I went, okay. I think it was at QMC. And it took me about five minutes to work out that I wasn't going to be a civil engineer. I was too uncivil to be a civil engineer. So um, I was just like larking around for the rest of the day. I remember this, this, this uh, kid called James Nicholas de Soir. And he was, he was guessing my name. He guessed my name. He knew it became a P, my surname. He said, it must be Osbert Pilchard. I said, no, you're, pretty <laughs> close. you're close. But um, when, when, it, when the time came to actually come up with a pseudonym, um, Osbert Pilchard was pretty close, so Orlando was better. So yeah. Orlando Pilchard it was. And um, what were you initially working on at Acornsoft? Oh, I originally did Arcadians uh, that, sum, that summer when I was still at school. And then I came back after my um, Cambridge entrance and um, worked for them for another four months. I did BBC Music and BBC Chess. And um, I didn't really like the experience of working for a company very much, I must admit. Not that anyone ever does, but I, I, I was young and I didn't like it. Did so you I, kind of uh, not like having the bosses and the managers and that no, kind bosses, of stuff? No, the bosses and the managers were fine. It was just the working conditions. Um, I was um, sitting away at a keyboard the other side of a very thin partition from a daisy wheel typewriter. Now, if you can remember daisy wheel typewriters from those days, they were about as loud as a, a jet fighter taking off. <laughs> and it was just horrible. I just, I just couldn't concentrate in the day. So I ended up working nights to get stuff done because I just couldn't concentrate. So um, that's my experience of working in office. I didn't really like it and didn't do it again for another ooh, 25 years or whatever. Well, BBC Chess is quite an intriguing title because, I mean, writing... I mean, I've never written a chess game, but I imagine there's quite a lot involved in that, you know, doing, preempting all the moves the, character, the, the human's going to make and actually program the algorithm and everything. I mean, was that, was that a complex project to work on? Uh, no, not at all. Um, 
what had happened was that um, Acorn had a bunch of directors who did different things for them. One of them was a guy called Arthur Norman, and he was a don at Emmanuel College. And he was this lovely bloke. He was kind of, um, he always shambled there and he shambled in and shambled out. Um, and uh, he'd, he'd, like, he'd written a chess program. You know, Alan Turing had written a chess program, so why wouldn't he? Um, so he'd written it for their system five or whatever their, their original system, original uh, device was. And he want, they wanted it, his old code in 6502 kind of lumped forward and brought onto the, the, you know, onto the BBC Micro and just give them nice shiny graphics. So my job was just to take his uh, shabby old code and give it shiny new graphics, old water in new pot, whatever it is. Um, so I did that. And then uh, people said, well, it's not very good, is it? And because I played chess, I'd have to say, no, it's not. So then I went through this process of having to add things in to make it look as though it was better than it was. Like I had to put a kind of a, an opening book that sort of pretended to be an opening book and I had to fix his castling bug and that kind of stuff. So it was just, you know, it was just stuff. Um, it, was, it, was, it was just, you know, a bit, a bit of work I did and fixed it and moved on. You know, the truth is that most people get beaten by even the lowest settings on chess programs. So it doesn't really matter. Obviously, you were known for your work on the uh, micro, uh, BBC Micro. What did you think of the other 8-bit computers at the time? Um, I was a bit of a snob when I was doing it, because actually, if you um, if you work on the BBC Micro, there's something that's really elegant about it. It's It was really, really well th- thought through. BBC Basic, the way that kind of just fitted in with the system, was just really sweet. And um, it kind of gave you a feel for... It was sort of architected in a way that... Other, other devices weren't really. I mean, I, the, the Spectrum had a bit of it, but not much. Really, the BBC's architecture was very clean and very, you know, just very nice. And everything else felt like a bit of a step down. Yeah, but, didn't BBC Basic allow you to do machine code or assembly right, language yeah. in line as well? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So you know, all my stuff was written, you know, actually embedded in BBC Basic. It was perfectly nice. I you know, would have, have, have a bad word heard about, said about it because it's great. So I was a bit of a, I was a, bit of a snob when I was very, very young as far as BBC Micro goes. But actually, as time went on, I ended up working for just about every other platform apart from the Spectrum. So that's all right. Well, you did some almost arcade-perfect versions of popular games, you know, like Arcadians you mentioned and Zalaga. I mean, were there any copyright issues arising from using those kind of, you know, plays on those titles and the games have been quite similar by, you know, companies like Namco, for example? Um, there were so all kinds of things that went on, mainly on to do with named copyright, because the graphics were never quite as good. So they're always a bit kind of tatty around the edges, slightly lower resolution. The animation wasn't quite as good, um, this kind of thing. Um, the, the thing is that the, you know, the arcade machines had hardware for drawing sprites, which these little 8-bit machines didn't. So you're always going to struggle. And so Namco wasn't really that bothered. Unless you said, uh, you know, you call it Galaxians, then they get kind of very upset. But if you called it something Elseans, they go, whatever. The days of copyright um, really have changed haven't they haven't they just yeah uh in 1984 you came out with a huge hit which was the game frack and it was in a, a cartoon style and a kind of arcade platformer uh, could you tell us the story of this and how how it started i had very high ideals one of the things that maybe didn't really fit the, the industry was that i was very idealistic and lots of other companies were very not necessarily pragmatic but certainly not quite idealistic like me. I really wanted to do something that was great, really, really great. And I, I didn't really want to compromise. So I had this idea that I could do a, a kind of a, my own Japanese arcade game. And I wanted to just be, be, it'd be non-violent. I, I was all, you know, it was 1984 and I was, I was already sick of um, shooting things and killing things. I didn't want to kill things. And I didn't want it to be like a pure abstract thing. I wanted to have character. So if you want something with character and with kind of cartoon outlines and you want it to just look really nice, you're going to really struggle on these little machines. But I just tried a whole load of things and a whole load of things. And from the kind of the massive stuff, Frax sort of emerged from the mist. And it was actually, actually really good. And um, playing it now, it still feels really good. So, But really that's because I didn't really want to compromise. So, you know, I did the best I could. Well, he's a caveman with a yo-yo. I mean, that, that was a very interesting concept, you know, like you said, moving away from traditional weapons. Why a yo-yo then? Where, where did that idea come from? Well, I, I'd always liked yo-yos when I was a tiny kid, and I wanted a, a, a game mechanic that was just oh, not killing, not not shooty, not punchy. 
And it was very difficult. Once you kind of like cross things off that list, you have to find something that is, isn't those. And um, it took a while to find a yo-yo. But yeah, yeah, a yo-yo ends up really well because you're stuck into your yo-yoing while you're yo-yoing. There's a sort of, you can reach longer, but you're more vulnerable kind of game trade-off to it, which is nice. So actually, I liked it. And yeah, it's it stuck. And it's absurd. Was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, you can't beat a bit of absurdity. Yeah, before before they invented the wheel, they invented the yo-yo. <laughs> yeah. You, <said> it. <laughs> you know, doing graphics of that quality must have been a, quite a challenge on the uh, BBC. Did you use any hardware tricks? Um, not for frack, apart from just oh, but it's, it's the scrolling, side scrolling, which was a nice thing. No, it was, it was later ones like Firetrack that used lots of hardware tricks. But Frack was kind of fairly basic, although I had to do a lot of clever software fitted into the space. Because if you take 20k out for, of 32k for the screen and then the rest of the VOS, you haven't really got a lot left. So it was pretty tight. Um, BBC had the hardware scroll on its ULA, so you could scroll in bunches of four pixels in Moat 1, which was good enough. And luckily, that's exactly how many pixels he moved each step. So curious that where did the name frack come from for the game and wh- why did he say it then it was a friend of daryl's um and she used to say frick frack frock and she was annoyed and oh, i just i wanted to have something like short and punchy and just frack was great why not why would he say frack <laughs> it reminds me of a frag which was um you know 2000 ad <laughs> yeah that's true yeah, and, and yeah. frack was also in um, battlestar galactica yeah, that, yeah. That was their swear word of choice. I didn't know that at the time, though. It's just one of those things. It's a coincidence. Well, what did you think of the C64? And uh, I know you were involved with the port as well. What was that process like? Oh, it was a bit sad, really. Um, the guys working on it were doing all right. Um, they, did, they were working for a company called Statesoft. Um, but Statesoft was part of a company called MicroDealer UK, who was a, a distributor. And um, most of the way through the, um, the release... A micro dealer went down and um, they took a whole load of my stock and um, the state soft went down as well so the game didn't really get um, released properly and I didn't get a penny from it so it's one of those things so you know, they were called the B team because every time they did a demo they'd say oh, bad news boss followed by whatever else has gone wrong in the development but um, you know they, they did an alright job but it was, just, it was just bad timing I'm afraid it's more bad timing than B team well, I read that you were working on Frack 2. What was that game going to be like and why didn't it happen in the end? Okay, Frack 2 was a um, vertical scrolling isometric um, game uh, with Trog Jr. on a skateboard with a boomerang. And I did some demos for it. And it worked, worked all right. You could, you could like um, skateboard around the screen and uh, I had some animations and stuff. But the vertical scrolling wasn't very good then. And I wanted to do it as a musical. Um, and I had to kind of really go, well, actually, um, I'm probably trying too hard here. That This is, um, I'm probably like 20 years too late, too early for this. In terms of that, I'm probably still, I was actually probably 40 years too early, but never mind. Yeah, so that was great. Frack 2. Uh, Frack 3, I did a demo with um, in 3D, where um, it kind of blocks from, Blocks were scrolled around with a kind of animated truck in the middle and did that on the Archimedes, I think. That's quite fun. Yeah, it was all right. But um, it, it was a long, long way off being, being a game. And that, at that point, the BBC market was dead, the Archimedes market was dead, and um, it, it was very difficult to get stuff going. So it was just timing. Yeah, the Archimedes was a lovely platform. But again, I mean, as a gaming system, even though it was very capable, it, it just never really seemed to take off. Even though I know that they tried with the home market, didn't they, with the, the A3010 briefly? Yeah, yeah. You know, in, in everything I said about the BBC Micro was just true for the Archimedes, only squared. It was a beautiful system. It was fast, really fast. The graphics were much better. The sound was much better. The operating system was much cleverer, and but with the same sort of basic kind of design. So for Wilson's fantastic on that. It's all great. You can't look at that and think, well, they did a bad job. No, they did a great job. But it just wasn't pitched right for anybody. And um, people couldn't afford it. People didn't want it. It wasn't really uh, anything. It just sat, fell between all the cracks. It's just one of those things. The people who loved it loved it to bits. No, I loved it to bits. But you know, was there, were there enough people buying Archimedes games to make it worth my while? I don't think so. Sorry. Well, the next... 
Our Vark title uh, wasn't until 1987 where you returned with Firetrack. Um, wh- yeah. Why did you have such a long break and uh, what was going on? I tried all kinds of things. I, I did a whole lot of demos. I, I, you know, I did all kinds of stuff. And Firetrack itself took a long, long time. Um, I think I may have done Enduro Racer at the same time. I think I, was, I certainly did Dandy at the same time. So there were those kind of other games that were going on at the same time that were, were needed finishing. I don't know. Um, Fire Track was a real, real tough one. I kind of just pushed it, pushed the platform too hard, really. To fit it in, all the graphics had to be really, really heavily compressed, and it was really insanely compressed. And all the graphics were you know, really tight. Everything was really, really tight. So it was just a bit unfortunate. And then um, because I'd, I'd, I'd lost so much money with Frack, with uh, Micro Dealer going down and everything. And all the piracy as well was, wasn't very great. wasn't great. Um, I, so I'd done a deal with Activision, I think it was, Mediagenic, for Firetrack. And they, they never really took off. Um, they had a game coming in from America at the same time called, oh God, a very, very, very similar t- title, but to do with fire, fire, fire something else. And um, they had no interest in it in the end. So, you know, you can write software, but you need to have a promotion side. And I'd kind of been sold on the dream that they would actually promote it, but they didn't. Which is unfortunate. I mean, you mentioned piracy at the time as well was obviously a big concern. I mean, you know, tape to tape and disc to disc copying was so easy to do. Did you try to do any um, anti-piracy implementation in your games or anything like that? I tried to patent one, but that didn't go very well either. That's one of those stupid things. Uh, You you try. Um, In the game itself, I just put a load of self-modifying code and... Um, tried to make it, make it a bit difficult to decompile, but actually people just did because that's what they did, just did for everything. So you know, it's one of those one of those things you can, you just can't prevent it. People just what was the one you tried to patent? Um, it was to do with um, a little a little sphere with numbers on it, and digits. But it's just one of those things you, you try to do these. You know, I, I was just trying to do everything at the time. So you know, I, I would say like I think like Frack, I really really enjoyed, and it was like a a kind of high high point in terms of the game, in terms of what I did with it, in terms of you know, how it looks and how it played and everything. But in terms of all the business around it, it was a bit of a disaster that, um, you know, it, it kind of supported the company for a bit. But um, everything around it, there, there was just a lot of just bad stuff in the industry. And, you know, yeah, which we hear that a lot on this show. I mean, you yeah, often, you know, there's games that you regard as being, you know, you hear that they're a big success, but then in the background, the business side of it, didn't work out so well. Yeah, like I a, think that must have been a common theme back it's then. It's a very common theme. Like I say, there was a lot of exploitation. Um, there was lots of um, overhype and a lot, you know, a lot of broken promises, let's say, uh, being generous about things. I don't know. It was uh, it was never a huge industry, not in the, not to the degree that it became later. It was, you know, it was a real cottage industry. And the idea that you could sell games in America was like, oh, really? Wow, no, not really. I don't think so. It never happened. I mean, the, you know, they, they sold BBC Micro in America. You know, maybe a thousand or something, but not, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not going to change the world, is it? Let's face it. When you work with um, System 3 on their interestingly named combat game, Bangkok Knights, what do you remember about that project? Oh, that's a lot of fun, actually. Bangkok Knights. I still have a folder of um, all the sketches f- for the main character there. Um, Mark Hale, he set up this thing where we were all working in a house in Watford somewhere, and there was me, and I, 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 there was a lot of fun, and they had an R-type in the garage. The original source code had been written by Andromeda, I think it was, in, in Hungary. But the story behind that is quite, quite grotesque, actually. Um, the, they had like a, a sprite editor, because they used like these big, big sprites, big, tall, extended sprites. So they, the idea was that they would um, have these huge, huge sprites, and then transfer them into the game. Uh, but the guy writing the game was using Forth, which is not the best language in the world. Oh, wow. And um, when he tried to animate the main characters, they would go through their animation sequence, but the fourth, fr- uh, there was four frame animation, but the fourth frame he'd limp. So he'd go, move, 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 limp, move, 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 limp. And he couldn't get rid of the limp. Everything he tried, he couldn't get rid of the limp. He, would, he, would take to, he took to walking around the office with the limp. I swear this is true. And <laughs> um, then he would walk further around the office with a limp, trying to figure out what was causing the limp. And then he would walk out of the office door, around the landing, and then back in again. And then he would walk out of the office, into the street, walk around. One day he never came back. 
just, it just driven him mad. <laughs> that's crazy. So they, they, they said, I, I said to them, oh, do you have any source code? And the guy said, well, yes, it's um, written in fourth with Hungarian comments and it drove one programmer mad. And I said, I think I'll work on it from scratch if it's okay with you. So, yeah, that's the, that's the story of um, the, the, uh, the limping man in Bangkok Nights. But he was all right. You know, the game what, without the limp plays all right. Well, you released one of the early 3D pool simulators as well, uh, Sharky's 3D pool. And that was like three years before Archer McLean got in on the act. Um, yeah. What was the story with that? Um, okay, the story with that is if you ever played an arcade game called Afterburner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You love it. Okay, I love, love Afterburner. It's a great game. But you also remember the, um, the, the track demo at the start, which is a load of balls kind of pivoting, yes. pivoting around. Yeah. Okay, well, I basically, um, for fun, I did that demo on BBC. So I had, I had a load of the balls going around. And I thought, this is really good. What ball game could I do that's got 3D balls in? <laughs> so um, within a week, I had a demo. And yeah, just carried on writing. It was great. So um, it was actually more like a puzzle game in the end because it had a load of trick, trick shots to you could um, try and solve. How do, you, how do you get all the balls in the bucket from here? So that was, that was basically what I did. So yeah, that was, it came out of an after, afterburner ball demo. And and the other pool and snooker players, you know, they spent a lot of time getting the physics right. And all credit to them, that's what they did it for. I didn't do it for that. I just did it because it was fun. And I had a, a nice uh, 3D ball demo. <laughs> that probably explains why I can play Sharky's 3D pool, but I can't play real pool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can't, <laughs> I can't play real pool. Well, actually, no. I think I think everyone can play pool off about a pint and a half. For about, yeah, for, you think you can. For about 10 minutes. The confidence. For about 10 minutes, yeah. The confidence. <laughs> this is kind of a sweet spot where you think you can play pool. And, um, and, and you know, you, you, you hit a couple of balls and you think, oh, this is great. And then you can't alter that. So that's fine. Well, that game was published by Firebird. What was it like working with them? Um, it was nice. I knew I knew some of the people. And it's, it, was, it wasn't a very big industry back then. And people like Colin Fweege and everyone. And, yeah, it was just it was a nice experience. That was kind of not too far from Firebird's demise. I don't, know the t- I don't remember the exact timing, but I was definitely, I wasn't one of the early early authors, that's for sure. Well, you helped out um, Activision with uh, Ghostbusters 2. Uh, why, why did they need to call you in? Okay, um, Ghostbusters 2. <sighs> There's this, a couple called um, Stefan Ofnowski and his wife Anna. And they lived over near Stonehenge somewhere, I don't quite know. Um, and like a whole load of people, they got some kids to write a game for them. In this case, it was Ghostbusters 2. They, these kids were like kind of 15 or maybe 16. And they were, they were, basically, they taught themselves to program. And they'd, they'd learned how to peek and poke and kind of gone up a little bit from that. And that was it, really. So they didn't really know how things worked. But, you know, even using like, I don't know, 25% of the opcodes, they managed to write this game. Well, you know, all credit, they wrote, they wrote a game using like, you know, this tiny subset of the language. And... Um, it just needed a little bit of pushing them over the line, that's all. So I just went I went along for a couple of days and just got them sorted out. I think they were more impressed that I could play Depeche, Depeche Mode on their keyboard than my actual programming. There you are. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Wait, which tune? I don't remember. I, I don't remember. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. There you are, kids. But, well, how did you transition to the 16-bit era? Well, I think my first 16-bit game was probably 3D Pool. I, I think I wrote that on the ST Sorry, ST, and then the Amiga. I think it was basic. That was basically it. Yes, I, I, that, I didn't really use a lot of it processing power on that. It was more, more to do with just getting the graphics looking nice and animating nicely, because the BBC was a bit clunky, and I did what I could with it. But it was just, it was nice to have you know just real polygons, you know. And um, there were some really big, impressive titles coming out at a time like Batman and uh, movie licenses. Uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day was one. Um, what was your involvement there, and did you uh, like the film as well? Um, I only really liked the first Terminator film, to be honest, and then it went on a bit, 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 bit of downhill. Um, the first Batman, I remember going to um, Leicester Square with Gary Lydon um, and a whole bunch of people, and um, we watched Batman and, uh, at the cinema there, and I remember um, the first time Jack Nicholson comes on the screen, we I started pissing myself laughing because <laughs> he was just taking the eating the screen up just taking the piss it was great it was like just uh, you are my number one 
Well, it's not Simon, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, let's, let's broaden our minds. All this kind of thing. It's just, just overact, terrible, terrible, terrible overacting. But we were laughing. And, but everyone else in the cinema seemed to be like kind of, I don't know, DC purists. <laughs> like, shh, shh, don't do that. Don't shh. Which made us laugh even more. So yeah, so I did like on the film and thing. Um, but my, my role was uh, much smaller, unfortunately. I'd written some compression software that just was, was kind, of, kind of quite effective at, and quite quick to decompress. And Probe used that on a whole bunch of their titles. So I got a lot of credits for doing stuff on titles which I did basically nothing on. Was that the story with Mortal Kombat 2 as well then, on the Mega Drive? Um, scaled up a bit. Mortal Kombat 2, um, they had a bigger problem than, than normal because they had so many graphics. From the arcade game, it was like lots and lots and lots of animation. Or digitised as well, wasn't it? Um, sort of kind of, sort of digitised and kind of tidied up. So it was kind of stylized. Uh, so they had tons and tons of animations. And, you know, the cost of the uh, ROMs they were using was insane. So they needed someone to come in and write a bit of software. So I basically, I think it took me about an afternoon, said, try this. They went, oh, that works. <laughs> and all of a sudden they could fit it in, much smaller ROM. And so they were happy as Larry. And of course, I should have charged £10,000 for it, but I don't think I did. Because just... that was such a big title, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, and um, the cost of the ROMs was a huge, huge part. In, in those days, on the kind of cartridge games. So yeah, that's one of those things. Well, you programmed the uh, Amiga CD32 packing title, Wing Commander. Uh, what was it like to work with the Amiga CD32? And were they were they trying to rush you all along? Um, I'd done Wing Commander on the, the Amiga itself, and that had been quite a quite a feat for me. When I was 27, I, I actually fell very, very seriously ill. They had to basically. I spent six months in hospital just kind of getting over. It was encephalitis, which is like meningitis, really. So, but I was, I was, I just started writing Wing Commander and they held it for me. They said, no one else wants to do it. This is yours. So basically, I then had to um, finish the game in, I don't know, seven months from a standing start. And I quickly found out that actually I wasn't very well. That I, I was better, as in not lying in bed looking at a wall. But I was actually a very, very long way from being, you know, where I was. I was only really at maybe 30 or 40% of my capacity before. So all, and I had this big game to write. So I had to uh, change the way I worked completely. Because whereas before, I was, I was a bit of a kind of a, uh, I don't know, more physical programmer. I would just like to kind of crack on and just do stuff. And if it finished at four in the morning, so be it. But, you know, if, if you've been, had a brain injury, you know, you can't do that. You have to kind of work smarter. So I had to work really, really smart and write lots of tools to do things for me and just tidy stuff up and just test for me. And so then, you know, but, but everything worked out. Um, we had the English version and the German version came out in time for Christmas and um, everything played through and the testers were happy, so that was great. And then not long after they said, oh, can you do the CE32 version for us? And I just bolted it out. I didn't, I didn't spend very long on it. In fact, I don't even remember writing it, to be honest. It was so quick. Um, and yeah. And the, the sound libraries as well, I, I remember there was some uh, uh, really good orchestral sound on um, Wing Commander as well. That what was, was Mark, the process? That was Mark Knight. He was really good. Um, That's my first time working with Mark. He was great uh, because he'd been Young Violinist of the Year, I think, or uh, something like that. You know, he was probably a trained musician and had all this stuff, all this, this music from um, the Fat Man, was it? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, George Sanger, yeah. Yeah, I met, I met George, yeah. He was all right. Um, so, but... Mark basically took that and turned it into tracker tracker format, I think, and it just came out really well. It was just really, really great because um, the music um, was sort of responsive to the game. So it would kind of flip to a, a kind of related track or theme when the game changed. When, like if you had um, a missile on your tail, you'd go, oh, his, his missile on your tail music. And so it would kind of seeg into that. So actually it was very, very nice indeed. So that was ported to quite a few systems as well, wasn't it? I think there was even a 3DO version of it and a Mac version later as well, I remember. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they did a lot of stuff. Um, the, the disappointing thing was that for the Amiga version, what I did was I basically wrote this giant sort of PC engine that, that kind of sat between um, their code and the Amiga and it turned, basically turned all this, the rendered screens into blitz so that um, it would kind of do all the splitting conversion into an Amiga screen kind of behind the scenes. It wasn't as quick as it could have been, but it was pretty quick. 
all things considered. But they basically, um, they didn't want the sequel. And I kind of thought, well, actually, you know, it'd, be, it'd be nice to just do the, you know, the next one along. But they didn't want it. So that's the way it goes. Well, obviously, before we prep any interview, we have a little uh, cheeky look at Moby Games to you know, see what games you're credited <laughs> with. I love the fact that you're credited as doing the incredibly clever programming bit on Duke Nukem 3D. <laughs> what was the story there then? And what was your involvement with that? Um, I, I basically took um, uh, Duke Nukem 3D onto the PlayStation with Paul Shirley. And you know, Paul did a lot of the cl- lots, lots and lots of the clever stuff. Probably more than me, to be honest, because he's a smart guy. Love him to bits. And again, Mark Knight came back and did the music, which was great. And uh, we had my, my my old friend Ian Boffin doing the levels and testing, and that, that was great. So you know, we had a lot of fun doing it. Just you know, you just write these things. It was a it was a good experience actually. It's one of the, one of the few kind of proper team games, team developments where everything sort of came together in a nice way. The difficult bit there was um, the build engine. Ken Ken Silverman was it? Yeah, Ken Silverman's build yeah, engine. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and um, Ken's a smart guy, and but um, it's not really a great fit for PlayStation. So we had, but so because basically PlayStation wants um, things in certain ways, and it was really done as a kind of a PC thing. But um, we managed to kind of um, trick the PlayStation into doing more or less all we wanted it to do. It's, it's a shame that we, that we couldn't have more colours than we did, but it's just the way it, well, it looked all right. It was great, and. Um, then we went into test with Sony. Sony's testers are very, very good. And um, they found a problem on the first level. Um, we went, sorry, from the first level. And they found that if you kind of went to a wall and sat on this kind of a window ledge sort of thing, and you kind of jumped around a bit, you could go through the window and end up the other side. And a million people had played that on PC and not found it, but they found it. So um, they said, to, so basically um, they said to me, oh, it must be in your code. I said, I don't think so. Went back to the PC version. Was able to do exactly the same thing on the PC version. So, <laughs> oh wow! You know, so I, 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 oh, I knew I'd done the same thing. So it was basically an exact port. Everything worked exactly the same. And it's amazing as well because looking at the build engine, the development of that, it was pretty much Ken started it as a as a teenager, and then it grew into this uh, really innovative engine with like transparency and stack scepters and like ramps and all of this. Absolutely, yeah, it's great. You know, um, it was quite mature by the time we got to it. So there was, like I say, ramps and things. But we were able to kind of make all those work on the PlayStation well enough. Well, I heard you're also involved in the uh, PS1 officially licensed X Files game. Yeah, I have um, actually on my wall here. I have a, a picture of The Simpsons that um, the producer Gary Scheinwald gave to me from um, at the time. Uh, it was a lot of fun because um, the the team who were writing that were over in Seattle. And they were having some dark, dark days because they'd written it on a PC, I think using MFC, and they basically tried to get it working on the PlayStation and it just didn't work very well. And they were kind of a bit stuck. So Gary Simon said, you know, if you fly you and your wife over to Seattle for a couple of weeks, uh, let's see if we can sort this out. I said, yeah, sure, I'll give it my best. So um, they've been running a PlayStation game in 16-bit mode. Now, if you know the play, if you know the X Files at all, you know that um, it relies on shades of grey. And if you're having shades of grey, you need all the bits of resolution you need you can to get them. So the game had to be in 24 bit mode. So it just it just could not work in 16 bit mode. But they didn't have any graphics things that would support it. So I basically um, wrote them some tools for um, using the kind of PlayStation's rendering tricks to render stuff in 24 bit. It's not really supposed to do work like that, but I made it work like that. And it ended up looking really, really nice. So, um, you know, they were from going from almost to the point of jacking the whole project to actually really liking it. So um, if, you, if you do play the X-Files game on the PlayStation, you'll see that actually it does look rather nice. Well, I read there was around 50 games in your career that you started but never finished. Can you tell us about any of those and, and why so many? Are you a bit of a perfectionist? I was a lot of a perfectionist. One, one of my friends at the time said, uh, you writing games like um, Wimpy Building Foundations. That's what Andy said. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I was a bit like that. The, you know, it's, like I say, I, I wasn't a really great fit. I was an idealist. and I, I, I didn't really see why I should have to compromise. And also, I didn't really see why anyone should have to buy a game that wasn't really, really good. So, you know... In, in retrospect, I should have finished more games and just been a bit more pragmatic about it. But you know, I was who I was, so that's how it worked. 
And do you have any of those unfinished games? And would you ever release them? Um, I don't know. It was. I have some discs upstairs in the, in the loft, so I might, I might have, I might dig them out one day and um, share the love about a bit. Because I know there's lots of people who love looking at these uh, um, unfinished games and things, and also other people like finishing uh, finishing unfinished games. So maybe, maybe there's, a, there's a bit of a kind of a, a trade off to be had there that someone might want to finish some of these unfinished games. Yeah, particularly if it's. Um... BBC games and others forums like Star Dot where they'd yeah. be over the moon to see that kind of thing. The Star Dot guys are great. They really, really helped me with with Frack. Um, a whole a whole bunch of them tested it. When I started it, it was it was it was just like probably a week too early, but they, you know they all stuck with it and they all they all played it and yeah they really liked it. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a really nice community over there. Well, let's talk about Frack because obviously he's back for 2021, yeah. um, and you just released a new version on Steam. So. Tell us about this new version and why you decided now was the right time to bring Frack back. I just always wanted to do Frack again, but I never, ever thought, I never, never thought, how can I do it? What's the point? It always struck me as one of those things that you could do. At one point, I tried to do a, an Amiga version, but my heart wasn't, wasn't, just wasn't in it. I, I, I tried a lot of stuff, but with uh, my friend Justin Govanovich. No, I, I tried stuff, but like I could say, um, games is a bit of a calling in the way that you have to want, really want to do it. And, and if it's not, not really working, it kind of really drags. And Frack back then was, wasn't really working. But I, I, anyway, it was about just over a year ago that I, st- I, st- I thought, well, I, I can bring this back. And I started looking around at my old source code and started looking around at the, the kind of things I could use to bring back to life. And you know, so I found Game Maker Studio. And for all its issues... It was this funny little language. It's actually really very good. And it was for what I was trying to do, which was a 2D game without being too clever. And just kind of, just, you know, I had certain things I want, there are certain rules I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to make it the game I would have created in 1984 had the hardware been good enough. If, if the BBC Micro had been 100 megahertz rather than two, what would it look like? And that, that's kind of what I, I aimed at. I just tried to create something that was, you know, the the the, the BBC perfected rather than Frack perfected, if that makes sense. And what new things did you put in there? Well, um, I, I put in the things that I took out originally, for start. For example, um, you've got these three different enemies, the Scrubbly, the Hooter and the Poglet. And each of them are originally de- designed to have different movements. So Scrubbly was supposed to go side to side upon a ledge. The Poglet was supposed to go up and down a ladder. And the hoot was supposed to bounce up and down, up and down. And so I put them all in, and it wasn't very hard to do it at the time. But they they just slowed the BBC down too much. So I took out the the, 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 the scrubbing moving, because that was way too big. So I thought, oh, I'll just have the other two then. Still too slow. Took out the hoot, no, the, 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 the uh, poglet moving. Still too slow. So I just had the little hoot I'm, I'm jumping on down. I thought, that'll do. Still too slow. So in the end, I, I just took all the animation out. And just had it just without animation, which you know broke my heart at the time because that's what, what I was trying to do. But the machines weren't good enough. So in, when I was re- rebooting it, I thought, aha, now actually I can do the stuff that I took out in 1984. And that was, that was really, really nice. Do you have any plans to do Frack 2? I have some other ideas that I didn't put in. But after, after 55 levels, I'd kind of done my, had my fill of it. <laughs> maybe, maybe in a year's time, I'll um, do my other levels with the other ideas i wanted to do i wanted to do a level where truck can play the same level upside down at the same time which just makes sense there you are so but um i, I basically had to draw a line somewhere i thought no nah, that's enough done my, I've, I've done my done my reboot but there's always things as a games writer there's always things you want to do extra there's always always things yeah there's- the idea that you had for frag three sounded quite interesting on the archimedes maybe that would uh make a nice little steam title well it's, it's possible um frag two was actually pretty good. You know, it, it was fun. It was great. But um, you know, I had music for it. Because it's a musical, I wrote some music for it. Um, and I still have all the songs I wrote back then. Um, you know, like I say, it was probably 40 years too early, but what the hell. Well, Nick, if you do make it happen, you'll have to let us know and we'll have to get you back on to talk about <laughs> Frack 2. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. I'd be delighted, of course. 
Well, if people want to read all about the, you know, more about the story of Frack, you do feature in this uh, wonderful new book, Acorn, A World in Pixels by iDesign. Um, that I'll link up in our show notes as well. A real celebration of, uh, you know, games on that wonderful platform back in the day. Uh, what are you working on these days then, Nick? What's, what's going on with you now? Oh, God. Um, the games industry had some very troubled days around about the year 2000. I got sued for £2.58 million pounds by sales curve, um, which, was not, which was nice. It was a good time to look elsewhere. I went away and I did an MBA and thought, you know, once I've done an MBA, it was more like a therapy, really, that for all the bad stuff that had gone on. And I, I, came, I came back from that and I thought, actually, no, games industry is broken. <laughs> so basically having the, the, the uh, business degree proved to me that actually the games industry wasn't coming back anytime soon. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of a shocker. So basically I went, went sideways into embedded programming. So I've been working for multinationals ever since, really. And now you get to do games for fun, though. The indie scene's amazing, I guess. Now, you know, it's kind of a return to those bedroom programmer days. Exactly. You know, for Frack on the Reboot, I did all the music, all the graphics, all the code, the whole lot. It was like kind of a, a proper indie, you know, properly indie. You know, none of your um, team of 20 in, in five countries stuff, but no, just me. I did it. It's fun. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, Nick, it's incredible that Frack is back for 2021, and um, I now really hope you do continue with uh, with more games in the series. That would be incredible. But thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing your stories with us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been lovely. 